Welcome back to another edition of Cannabis in Canada with Jason Wilcox, coming to you from British Columbia, Canada. Figured while Health Canada is sitting there taking their time with their regulations and all, we get back to doing what we like to do best, and that's sharing information and learning how to grow better together. So that's kind of what this channel has always been about. We've been on the air, I think, seven years now. You know, uh, back then, there, I think there was five or six of us, and now there's like 250 channels teaching people the same stuff. Um, awesome. I think it's great because this is what, you know, 420 this year in BC was fabulous. It really goes to show how far we've progressed in just a decade, you know, in, in reversing reefer madness of 50 years uh, with simply logic and fact. So anyway, today's movie is solely about what growers don't talk about. Receiving plants like this. I know some of y'all haters are going to jump on. Oh, look at those plants. They suck, Wilcox. They look like crap. <laughs> I know, guys. You know, it's all good. Uh, what, we're, what this movie is about is how they look when I receive them and how they're going to look when I fix them using green planet nutrients. And we're going to talk about that in this video. Also, what every grower should do before introducing their plants to the grow room. These are fundamental things that we all need to look at um, as growers. So... When you do receive something like this, first, my co-host is missing. Certain times I can't use my co-host, other times I can. And for those of you who think I do all this stuff messed up, try being medical for 10 years and smoking all day long for 10 years, you'll realize you can function perfectly fine when you're still smoking. It's called medicine. It's like taking morphine for your first week, you're gonna be a little messed up. But after a month or two, it stabilizes. Um, that being said, We'll continue. So I'll ask my camera lady first, just to kind of take a, a panoramic view here, just or not a panoramic, but just a top to bottom view of the plant. And you can see there's a lot from, you know, you can see there, there's clearly some heat stress. There's definitely some water stress. And and clearly there, there's some, uh, some lodging going on here, uh, which is likely just moisture and uh, definitely stress either way. Um, you can also see that these are clearly in Rockwell cubes, which, you know, I, I grow in soilless medium. So being in Rockwell cubes is, it's not a big deal. It's just a matter of, of transplant. So when we look at issues like this, um, the first thing we want to do is look at first, are they all female? Are they potentially hermaphrodite? How do you know that? You know, how do you check? Males will have a little nub, you know, and some people will say you need a magnifying glass or whatever. To a trained grower, you can should be able to tell it by the naked eye. And uh, that's, you know, basically what we're going to try and show here. Is when you go into here, actually I'll do it this way for my camera lady so she can pick it up. You see this little hair right here? Okay, and then as we move down, you'll notice there's another one here. What this is, my friends, is a female. Simple. All females will have, those are the hairs you're looking for. If you grow from seed, they'll show up after about 30 days. Um, either as a nub or a hair. A little harder to diagnose at 30 days. I'd say 60 days, very clear. Um, you can definitely tell. Males tend to grow taller than females. These all came from clone. So, of course, I already kind of know they're female, but it's also checking because I didn't take the clones. I don't know the lineage. I know the strain, that's all. Um, and I know what they're saying the strain is. So I need to now do my own homework. So one, I'm now looking to make sure there's no hermaphrodite signs, which means there would be the female hair, but then there'd be little nubs as well. Early indicators of a hermaphrodite. You know, because of the stress, stress causes things to go hermaphrodite. So we need to check that. So we've checked that there's no hermaphrodism. We've checked that it's female. We know that it's stressed. We're gonna get into that. Um, the other thing we look at is when you get leaves like this one here, anything that's over 30 or 40 percent damaged, normally I don't suggest tearing your leaves off unless you have to, but rot like this attracts bugs and attracts mold. Okay, so we have to look at, at issues that are, that are at hand. Most importantly is bugs. Um, you don't want to be attracting anything. So removing any dead leaf and as well as gives a chance to revive better faster. It's already in shock, so I might be shocking it a little more by taking off and cleaning up little tiny leaves. Most of y'all know this doesn't really do much to the plant, but because they're just being introduced to the garden, 
There's, this is just stage one of several stages. Now, for those that don't like longer movies, you may want to change the channel because it's going to be a little bit of a long lesson because for those of us who love our plants, we really want to know what we're doing because there's nothing worse than bringing and introducing a new plant and realizing you missed something and that either costed you your crop or um, a lot of headache at the least. So simply getting rid of these. I don't have to go through a whole makeup job, but you can see how the leaves can collect relatively quickly. They will grow back, no problem. But getting rid of that dead debris, that's important. Next thing you want to look at, okay, plants there. Can I recover this? I know I can. Is there powdery mildew? Is there bugs? So for me, I would use a microscope in most cases, and I have used a magnifying glass already on this, and there are no bugs. You know, you would be actually, you can see baby mites, even when they're in the larva form, wiggling around on the leaf to a trained eye. So it's not hard to, to spot. Same with aphids, you can just look down the stalk. Um, you know, you're looking for deficiencies. There's no purpling in the roots, which would indicate, a, you know, a potassium or a phosphorus deficiency. You know, there's a lot of things that I'm looking at that are fundamental. The purpling in the leaves doesn't concern me. The curling down indicates water log or heat stress. One or two things. You know, so there's a few other things that can cause the leaves to go down. It could be too cold as well. Um, and what they're doing is they're kind of protecting themselves. So this is again why I say they're shocked now. So no matter what I do to them right now, they're going to take normally a week to come out of shock. What I'd like to do is try and show you how we can do it in probably 48 hours, you know, maybe maybe three days. But um, we'll try and revive these to, to be completely positive topism. They should be praying like this and all nice, lush, green growth. And uh, we're going to bring that to you. So the next step, of course, is to look at your roots. So here we can see, even though it's in the rooting cube, I still got nice white roots, like this one here. Most importantly, that when I look at this, even though I don't use rock wool, I have studied rock wool. And the, to know that this is fiberglass and to know that it holds so much water, the main thing that I'm concerned about is, is that root green? And if it is, you got to do more. You know, there's other things to, to address. However, this is working fine. The guy knew what he was doing, obviously. I think these guys just got stressed out a little bit because this particular person had to move his plants from one location to another. And, uh, and when you do that, of course, plants get stressed. Um, change in climate, you know, heat stress, I believe, was from the light just being too close. And, uh, and, and potentially the cold stress could simply be nothing more than that, the transport um, aspect of, of them being shocked. So anyway, we've now checked the roots, we've checked that they're female, we've checked for bugs. Next thing you need to know before you go into your transplanting stage, because they're at this, state, this level, they've been fed. They're not living off just the nutrients the first two weeks that you get because they're new. They're not young clones, these are like young plants. So we know that there's going to be a pH level and a PPM reading. <clears throat> now, with my book, I always have this stuff ready to go. I got my, I got my little book here, nice and simple. You can put this right inside your, your grow room or wherever, and uh, you keep everything from flowering, PPM, light meter, you know, reference notes, whatever it is. Most importantly, you document everything from A to Z. Um, and we're going to do that as we go through the show. Uh, mo how we do this, normally you know, I would take a reading differently. It would be in a pot and, and we're going to bring that to you. And uh, anybody who's watched my older shows has seen me take PPM readings before. Um, this is your standard PPM stick. Let me just put it out of its case here. This is your standard PPM meter or what's otherwise known as a dipstick to some growers. Like this will measure in CF and PPM. Now here in BC, we generally measure in PPM, you know, and these lights will flash and let you know what the PPM, which is basically the electroconductivity in your soil or your medium. So I don't know what's in here. I don't know what's in Rockwell. So before I go transplant it into brand new ProMix, which is preloaded with micronutrients, and other nutrients before I go stick nutrient on nutrient and potentially cause nutrient lockout or potentially cause burning of my leaves I want to know what's going on in here so that's what we're going to do most people would say you don't squeeze rock well you don't um, for the purpose of this test 
I'm squeezing this one plant. It's already been stressed, but I need to know a general idea. So I'll do probably two plants. But with this is how I will check my EC of this particular plant. Still don't got enough there. Same plant. because I got a few extra plants I don't mind if I actually kill one or two of them or if I notice any stunted growth. Most importantly is that I really want to know what my EC is. Well, you see how high that EC is? That's off the charts my friends. Okay, so what that tells me right away is that I could be in trouble. Um, that's really not a, not a good thing to have such a high EC. Um, the second thing that you're going to do is you're going to look at your uh, your pH. Now, with a brand new pH meter, you don't need to worry about uh, calibration, which is something you would normally need to do. Uh, to calibrate, you would use a product like this, which is available at uh, Pacific Northwest Garden Supply in Surrey. Simple pH, you know, you, you got your your P, or your your calibration uh, solution. Uh, there's pH 7 and then there's another pH that you can use for dialing it in. Um, really pH 7 is all, all you need generally in my own opinion. Um, so calibration, that only applies again to if you've used your meter a couple times, keeping them clean, washed. Most importantly right now is that we want to know a general idea. We already know the PPMs are off the chart. And with this here, I got an a EC of 5.7 or a pH of 5.7. Now for hydroponics, it worked. You can mist away at 5.7. But for dirt, soil, not good. We got to get her up to more like 6.8. Or sorry, um, 5.8 to 6.2 is kind of the target range that I'm aiming for. So having not had to deal with this before, I'm now going to have to flush these out, okay? This is why you do this test. This is a prime example. If I did not do this test, okay, for this person, then this test alone would have allowed me to potentially, because ProMix, brand new, when you first get your new soil, you don't need to feed. Growers make this mistake all the time. They get it and they, oh, feed the plants, feed the plants. The soil's preloaded for at least a week to two weeks. If it's Pro Mix or Sunshine Mix, one of the better products, a uh, professional grow mix, it's preloaded. Just have to read the label. You know, there's no reason to add nutrients at that stage. You know, unless you're in a situation like this of stress. And when I say nutrients, I'm talking about stuff like thiamine. Be like, you know, you want your B1 solutions. This and I, in this case for these guys, I'll be using Aussie Tonic available from Green Planet Nutrients. It's also available at Pacific Northwest Garden Supply in Surrey, as well as out in Maple Ridge. Now, Aussie Tonic, of course, having the B1 and the thiamine in there is fundamental for root growth and for stress. Plants are stressed. They're going to be more stressed, and now i got to flush each one of them out by running at least a liter of water.